Hey kids, Charlie Abuso here after lunch. Welcome to water class number three. We're gonna look at table G some more. We're gonna do some vocabulary and look at that beautiful picture, oil and water. Now, this is cool, right? Why does the oil float on the water? There's two things going on here. Why does oil not mix with the water and why does oil float on the water? Oil floats on water because it doesn't mix and it has a lower density, right? If you stir it up really quick, it'll kind of blur it up and mix it up a little, but then it comes back apart. Water is polar. Oil is nonpolar. Remember I told you like dissolves like? When water, which is polar, and oil, which is nonpolar, they, they are incompatible. They are immiscable. And you stir them up like mid, you mix them up a little, but then they come right back out. The water can't really glom onto it with its positive and negative sides, the polarity of the water molecules has no impact on the oil. The oil is nonpolar, so they can't really stick to the oil. The oil slips through the water's clutches. As the water tries to hydrogen bond together, the oil just slips through and it goes to the top. Now, if the oil was more dense, it would sink, but it still wouldn't mix. You would stir it up, but then it separates. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty, pretty cool. All right, oil's on top, water's on the bottom. How come? Oh, I already said this, like dissolves like. In this case, the oil is of course nonpolar, the water is polar, and the reason the oil is on top is because oil has a lower density, water has a greater density, and lower densities always float. That's why ice floats on water. Um, when a solution holds the most possible solute in solution, Right? When, when the solution holds the most possible solute, that's called saturated. If there's less than that amount, it's unsaturated. That's like Charlie chocolate milk and Janet chocolate milk. Now, right? that's that, saturated or unsaturated. Is a 100 ml solution of HCl at 80 degrees saturated if it contains 37 grams of HCl? So let me get out my table G. I'll find 80... 80 degrees, I'll find my HCl line, which is right there. And it looks like it should be able to hold 48 grams. Now, if it only contains 37 grams, oh look, oh, I don't have the right dot. That's not the right dot. We need the HCl line would be right here, right? That's 37 grams but the line is way up there. No, it could hold 47 or 48 grams. This is way below. The red line is 37. There's plenty of room to fit more in. So no, this is an unsaturated solution. Is 100 mLs of NaNO3 at 25 degrees saturated if it contains 90 grams? So we'll go to 25 degrees at the bottom and slide all the way up. Look, that red dot there. That's 25 degrees at uh, and 90 grams. It looks like at 25 degrees, it could hold like 92 grams. It's close. If the, if the circle, the little red ball is big enough, it'll look like it's touching, but no, it could hold at least 93, right? If you get a good look at that, we're under maybe 92, but certainly not 90. The curve is above that 90 gram line. How many grams of NaCl will saturate 100 mLs of water at 90 degrees? Well, let's find sodium chloride, runs right across almost at a flat line, but not flat. It's gonna hold 40 grams, 40 grams. Now, what would happen if you attempted to put 43 grams into that? Now, this is really cool, right? 40 grams fits in, that's right on the graph, 90 degrees NaCl. If you did that, 40 grams would dissolve, but three grams would fall to the bottom of the beaker because the water, the solution could only hold 40 grams of solute. If you put too much in, it doesn't dissolve. The maximum that dissolves, the saturation point would be 40 grams. Ah, some good stuff coming up. Will a 100 ml solution at 90 degrees be saturated if it contains 43 grams? Yay, darn right it will be. Not only will it be saturated, there'll still be three grams at the bottom. It doesn't saturate at 43, it saturates at 40 grams. You can't fit 43 grams in, but there's enough to saturate it, and then the rest 
will be at the bottom. Nothing on table G can hold more than the lines, the curves, right? That's the saturation point. You can't go over that. You can add more stuff, doesn't matter, right? If you have a glass of water that holds eight ounces and you put 12 ounces of water in it, you can put 12 ounces of water in it, but only eight's gonna stay. Four ounces is gonna go out the top. You can put 43 grams of sodium chloride into the solution, only 40 grams really goes in solution. The other three grams are just stuck at the bottom, swimming. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. All right, oh my gosh, look at this chart. There's a lot of blank stuff here. I'll give you a minute, all right? Really, in fact, I'm not gonna give you a minute. Hit pause, fill this in, because I think the next slide's gonna give us all the answers, all right? I didn't make 57 slides for this. I'm doing this a little quicker now. You guys are smart enough to just hit pause, hit pause, look at the slide, fill in the blanks, get out your table G, Write these in, you write S or U for saturated or unsaturated, and then it says, if it's unsaturated, how many more grams will fit into that solution? Now, if it is saturated, it's zero, no more fits, right? Pause, right? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna keep going, but hit the pause. Here we go. The only two that are saturated are 76 and 77, so no more will fit in. All the others are unsaturated. Now what you need to do is you find the temperature, you slide up to the proper compound and you figure out how much fits in. Now for the HCL, right? 60 grams are in 100 ml of water, but it could hold about 67. Now if you said 66 and it only has six grams more, that's about, it's still a little squiggly, it means about seven. With KNO3, you're unsaturated again. How much? Well, about five more grams fits. It depends on how you see these graphs. It's not exact, it's a graph, right? But it's gotta be close. Can't be 23 more grams, it's five or six. With KCL, also under the curve, and NACL again, under the curve. If you're under the curve, there's that much more room to fit. If you're over the curve, it doesn't matter, or on the curve, it doesn't matter, you're saturated. Any extra would just be at the bottom of the beaker. All right. Here we have two sodium chloride ions, right? Well, two sodiums and two chlorides. This is it. You have to imagine you put salt into water. Now, here's the salt. We don't have the water or the beaker yet, but if, if we had these ions in solution, the water would turn itself to orient itself to these ions. Now, the sodium ions are both positive. So they would attract the negative oxygen sides of water. And the chlorides, well, they're both negative. That means they would attract the hydrogen sides of water. So the water molecules themselves are literally going to orient themselves to these ions. And this is how it's going to look. With the sodium, hmm, there's a problem over there. Look at that. I'm going to have to cross something out because there's definitely a mistake over there. You know, when you make these kinds of things, this is wrong. I'll just cross this one out. This doesn't matter. The sodiums, which are positive, are gonna only attract the negative oxygen side. Here we have chlorides attracting just hydrogen, and here we have the sodiums attracting just oxygen. And who put that wacko water molecule, and that's like a wacko water molecule, it's not following the rules, that doesn't happen. And if it did, it would immediately turn around. Like, you know, water's are moving, the water molecules are moving around. It might say, whoa, and it would turn around, but I can't show that in the slide. That one's a little backwards. The oxygen sides of water are more negative because oxygen has a higher electronegativity value. So the negative oxygen sides of water tend to orient themselves towards the sodium cations Whereas the hydrogen sides of water, which have lower electronegativity values and be more positive, the hydrogen sides are more oriented towards the chlorides. Sorry for that little goofball mistake, right? That was a little goofball mistake. It's like a neophyte made this slide, not me. Explain in one sentence why the water molecule is gonna orient themselves. Well, the water molecules have a positive side, which is the hydrogen, and a negative side, which is the oxygen, because of electronegativity difference. The ions are also charged positive and negative. It's normal and expected that the positives would be attracted to the negative. So the positive hydrogens and the negative chlorides or the negative oxygens and the positive hydrogens. Oil, 
oil, mineral oil, vegetable oil, motor oil, they're nonpolar, right? And so they're not gonna dissolve in the water because like dissolves like, and they have a lower density, so they're gonna float. So what happens? What happens here? Like dissolves like, as you said that, the water can't catch, like it can catch the ions because of charge. So oil flows because it has a lower density and oil can't be trapped. Now, how many grams of KCLO fits into 100 mLs of water at 90 degrees? So let's see, 90 degrees, KCLO3, 10. How many grams of KCLO3? It's this one right here. It looks to be about 52 grams. And how many will fit in at 10 degrees? That's that same line. It slides all the way down. Looks like about 15. Is that right? KCLO3 at 10 degrees. No, that's not right. It's more like five grams. I'm gonna fix that right now. I don't, it's more like five or six. I'll put in six, right? That's a boo-boo. Here we go. So let's think about this. If we have a hot solution of 90 degrees, KCLO3 saturated, 52 grams of KCLO3 is dissolved in the water. What if we take that same solution and, and it's cold? Well, only six grams fits in, right? Because the KCLO3 line at 10 degrees is way down here. What would happen? Oh, now the, now the numbers changed again. Who the hell knows what's going on? If you have a 90 degrees to KCLO3 and you cool it down to 40 this time, so we're gonna go from 90 KCLO3, which has 52 down to 40, which seems to have about 15. Now nah, that's where the problem is. It's 40 degrees, not 10 degrees. I changed the wrong thing. Let me fix that. Thanks for your patience, right? I'm gonna do this at 40 degrees and I'll make this 15 again. Now, does everybody understand what just happened? I looked at the temperature and thought that that was right, but actually we're cooling it from 90 to 40. And at 40 degrees, the KCO3 is 15 or 16. So it goes from hot holds a lot to cold holds a little. So what's gonna happen? Literally, what's gonna happen to the, all that KCO3? You got, you got 52 grams dissolved. If you cool it down, so much less is gonna fit, what's gonna happen? Well, look at the arrows, see this is good now because I can see what I'm doing. We started out at the top red arrow, we go down to the bottom blue arrow because it cools off. We start out with 52 grams can fit, but only 15 grams can fit when it's cold. The rest of it falls out of solution. The water, instead of juggling really fast, it starts to juggle slower and slower and it drops a lot of the potassium chlorate. How much? Well, it drops 37 grams, because that's the, that's the curve. The curve will tell us how much you can hold when you're hot, and then when you make it cold, how much you can hold when it's cold, and the difference, it falls out of solution. Pretty cool. Let's see if we can do it again. You have a saturated solution of KNO3, 60 degrees, and it's 100 ml. So let's find that. It's 60 degrees, KNO3, and that line is going to be potassium nitrate. Where is that line? Here it is, way up here. I lost it. 60 degrees. Looks like at 60 degrees, it's going to be about 100 at 60 degrees, it's going to be about 105 grams. Everybody see that? 60 degrees, 105 grams for the KNO3. What if it's only 20 degrees? So 20 degrees, the KNO3 line looks to be about 35 grams. You see that on the, on the graph of the KNO3? Once you find it, KNO3, when it's hot, it holds a lot, and when it's cold, it holds a little. What happens when you cool it? Well, zero, 70 grams precipitates. How much precipitates? The difference. 
if you add 105 now and then you cool it and only 35 fits, the rest of it, 70 grams, falls out of solution. Bada bing, bada boom. So table G tells us how much solute fits in solution at a certain temperature, or it can tell you how much falls out of solution if you know where you start and where you're going by temperature. Start hot, get cold, or start cold, how much more will fit if you're going in the other direction. What happens if you put 140 grams of potassium iodide? Let's see what's gonna happen here. 140 grams of Ki, and it's gonna be at 10 degrees centigrade. At 10 degrees, 140 grams of Ki, well, actually it looks like only 135 grams fits. So 135 grams fits, five grams is at the bottom. See what I got here? 140 grams of Ki in a solution that's 10 degrees, 100 ml, only 135 grams fits. So five grams is at the bottom. Does it stop? Five grams is out and 135 grams is in? Actually, no, something really cool happens. Think about it, if you put salt in water, what does it do? It dissolves into water. Does it have a big brain? No, it doesn't have any brain. What does it do? It dissolves. What does the water do? It lets it dissolve. How much, how much of this potassium iodide can the water hold though? 135 grams. So if you have 135 grams already in there and it's saturated and you put more salt in there, what's the salt gonna do? It's gonna dissolve in because that's what salt does in water. Is water good with that? Not really, because this, this amount of water can only hold 135 grams. So what happens? Some of it dissolves and it drops different potassium iodide out. It keeps dissolving and it keeps falling out and it keeps dissolving and it keeps falling out. So at any point, you know the solution is saturated. It has 135 grams of, of this Ki dissolved. Which 135 grams? Well, there's 140 in the beaker. Only 135 gets dissolved. Five grams is always out. Which five keeps changing? It keeps changing. This is really cool. This is called a dynamic equilibrium. And I love this word. This is a great word. Dynamic means always changing. And equilibrium means always staying the same. Which means there's always going to be 135 grams dissolved and always five grams out. But they're going to keep changing places. It's going to keep dissolving. That's the forward reaction in this case. It's going to keep dissolving at the same rate it's going to keep undissolving, precipitating. I like 93. The rate of solvation equals the rate of precipitation. If the solution is saturated, it's perfect. It's full up. If you put more salt in the water, that salt dissolves in and other salt falls out. And then more salt dissolves in and more salt dissolves out. And the rate of dissolving and precipitating is the same, which means the solution always stays saturated with exactly 135 grams of Ki. There's always five grams that's not dissolved, but which five grams, that keeps changing places, right? Keeps changing places. I like that, dynamic equilibrium. We're gonna see that a lot. Now, look at this. This is not really a chemical equation, but look what happens when the solid sodium chloride goes into water. This should be water on top of that arrow there. Water. We end up with sodium ions and chloride ions aqueous. They dissolve in water. This has got two names, but it's really easy. It's called ionization or dissociation. The, the ions dissociate apart into loose mobile ions. The sodium chloride formula unit comes apart. So you can either call it the sodium chloride ionized into water or it dissociated into ions and dissolves in water. But when an ionic compound dissolves in water, we end up with loose mobile ions. Now, does sugar do this? Absolutely not. Sugar goes into water, disappears, right? You can't see it, it's molecular, but it turns into molecules. Does it make ions? Sucrose, table sugar, is not ionic. It's a molecular compound. There's no metals in those formulas, so there's no ions, but it does dissolve into molecules. Now, each molecule is gonna have what? Uh, 30, 45 atoms. That's pretty big compared to a single ion, but you can't see it, right? It's invisibly small. 
but the ionic compounds dissolve literally into loose mobile ions. Now, what does that mean? The word electrolyte is a pain in the neck. When I was in high school, it meant a solution that conducted electricity. And a solution conducts electricity if it has loose mobile ions. And that means if you have a glass of water and one crystal of salt, it's not gonna conduct electricity. There's not enough ions. But if you have salty water solution, sodium chloride solution, when the sodium chloride goes into the water, it all ionizes and you got bazillions of, of ions. And those ions are, allow the, the transportation or the, the transport of electricity through that. Pure water will not conduct electricity. So an electrolyte used to be a solution that conducted electricity because it had ions in it. But now the state hates you kids. I feel bad. The state says that something like sodium chloride solid, because it would become an electrolyte in water, because it would ionize in water, sodium chloride solid technically is an electrolyte, but it can't conduct electricity because it's not ions. It's not loose ions. It's locked together. So let's look at these answers. We'll go through them slow. Sodium chloride aqueous is an electrolyte because it's an ionic compound that's aqueous in water, which means it ionizes into uh, ions. And if there's sufficient ions, I mean, just more than some, it will conduct electricity. Now, sodium chloride technically is an electrolyte because it does number 94. It would turn into loose mobile ions. Will sodium chloride solid conduct electricity? No, there are no loose mobile ions. They're locked into a solid grid. Can't conduct electricity, but it's still an electrolyte. NaOH aqueous. NaOH aqueous, sodium hydroxide is the opposite of acids. It's a standard issue base. It's called the, it's called the base. It's an ionic compound. You'll have sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And yeah, it conducts electricity very well. NaOH solid is a white crystal solid, salt. Will it conduct electricity? Absolutely not. But it is an electrolyte because if you put it in water, it would do that. Silver chloride. It's ionic. Is it electrolyte? No. How come? Because it, when you put it in water, when you put it in water and you look on table F, because you always have to look. On table F, if your name is chloride, you tend to be aqueous. But look, there's an exception here called silver. Silver chloride doesn't dissolve in water. There's no ions, right? Silver, silver chloride solid will not ever become an ionic compound in water dissolved. It'll just be a solid. There'll be no ions. And silver chloride aqueous, that doesn't even exist. Look, I'm tricking you there. No. Silver chloride aqueous does not, if silver chloride aqueous existed, of course it would conduct. It would mean there's loose mobile ions. It doesn't exist. Now, what about this last one? Sucrose, sugar water. Is it an electrolyte? Absolutely not. There's no ions. It would dissolve, but there'd be no ions. So you can't get shocked if you're in a sugar water bath or a pure water bath. But if there's salty water, or ocean water, or you don't want to get into base water, that would hurt your skin. They conduct electricity, so you got to be careful. All right. BEOH is an electrolyte. I don't know. Let's look on table F. Oh, more review. If your name is hydroxide, you tend not to be aqueous except for exceptions, but beryllium is in group two. So beryllium hydroxide? No, it's not soluble in water. If it's not soluble, there's no loose ions. What about beryllium hydroxide liquid? This is melted. Now this is again, more trickiness. If you melt it, if you raise the temperature to 5,000 Kelvin and you melt it, yes, you would get loose mobile ions, right? How is it possible? Melted means loose ions. If liquid BEOH2 can conduct, is it an electrolyte? No, it's not. It can conduct electricity. It's not electrolyte because in order to be an electrolyte, you must be able to conduct electricity when dissolved in water. This stuff doesn't dissolve in water. Listen, it's a pain in the neck explanation. They, they really screwed this one up just to torture you. An electrolyte is an ionic compound that can dissolve in water. If it's dissolved, it will conduct electricity. If it's still solid, if it will dissolve, it's still an electrolyte. But an ionic compound that cannot dissolve in water is not an electrolyte. But all ionic compounds can be melted. And if they melt, they conduct electricity. 
pain in the neck. I'm sorry. I can't, I can't do it. I can't, I'm not the boss. If I were the boss, I would change the definition to back when I was in high school. It was so easy. And it was it worked fine. All right. Sodium chloride goes into water. We did this just before. I don't have the word water over the arrow, but when it goes into water, it forms ions, aqueous sodium ions and aqueous chlorine ions. There's two different names. We did this just a little while ago. We call that the sodium chloride ionized or it dissociated into the water. Does sugar do this? No, sugar dissolves into molecules. Sugar is not ionic. Now it is polar. Water's got a, a polar molecule and, and sugar's got a weird shape. So it's a polar molecule. Sugar dissolves very well. You put sugar in water, it becomes invisible. You could drink a glass of water or a glass of sugar water. It looks the same. Sugar water is sticky, tastes better maybe. Or I don't know if it tastes better. You might think so, you're a kid. The dissociation or ionization the sodium acetate in water with the phase symbols. All right, this is just a little funky. What's the formula for sodium acetate? Acetate, as you remember, is up on table F. You're just gonna have the solid, put it with the, in water, right? It requires some energy. You put it into water, it turns into sodium ions and acetate ions. The reverse, the reverse does not. So making this happen is going to be endothermic, right? But when you evaporate the water, you get your energy back out. So the sodium acetate solid becomes ions. And then the sodium ion and the acetate ion, if you evaporate the water out and it comes back together, that's gonna be exothermic. A lot of stuff to think about, hey, guess what? There's no more. Now, what about water? This is it, ready? Hydrogen bonding. It's always hydrogen bonding or it's review or it's table G, which is easy. Do your homework, right? Do your homework. The experiment for water we're gonna do, I gotta, I gotta do that. So we have, a, we have a water lab. We're not gonna do the water lab. I'm gonna make something else called the water experiment. If you're in class, you get to see it. If not, you'll watch a video, I guess, and then you'll answer some questions. Most of the stuff for water is just some simple review, right? Quick, easy, hopefully painless. Peace, love, and chemistry, over and out. Let me see if I can figure out how to, how to end this, okay? We're done. All right, bye.